suspects on the sprint, two of them. The cop is going. We need to know if he's going to be ready because we're two minutes away. This is what people watch us for as opposed to reading in the newspaper the next day. Boss, I need to see you get the color bars off. It's an event that's unfolding before your eyes. Yeah. Screw the tape, I need Moss. What are they looking for? You got to figure out what happened. You have to find the story. <laughs> Denver, Colorado, with the Rocky Mountains to the west and the Great Plains to the east, Denver has always been a city of crossroads and to this day remains a boomtown. Denver is a very good news town. I think as it's growing, it's becoming a better and better news town, which I guess is a way of saying that it's getting more and more problems. <laughs> The tragic shooting at Columbine High School and the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey brought international attention to Colorado. The story doesn't have to be a media magnet to be compelling. No one knows this better than the news team at KCNC News 4. Jan was a very vital person. People open their hearts to me in a way they don't to others. So I feel a big responsibility to make sure that I tell their story as well. But in the fast-paced world of local news, go now. We need to be there in five minutes. Things can go wrong at any time. The PIO just said they are not the Lopez brothers at all. She totally was wrong earlier. Next on News 4 at 5. Is there is a conflict between speed and accuracy. But speed can never be allowed to compromise accuracy. Never. Hitting the airwaves fast and with the right information is an ongoing challenge. This is based on 3 or 5, go. Especially when a story is breaking. A car and a truck, or what, do you know what kind of vehicles? A minivan and a police car. Bad accident, 14th and Dahlia. A police car responding to a call has broadsided a minivan. <laughs> police officer and the two passengers in the van are rushed to the emergency room. One female to university, two males to Denver Health, including a male police officer, although we're not sure. There's only a half hour to the noon broadcast. I'm sending a live truck out. It's going to be the lead live at noon. Not much time to get all the details of the story. We're going to send Larry Blunt. I had to hurry up and get out there. I'm Larry Blunt, a reporter and weekend anchor at KCNC-TV in Denver, Colorado. When I get there, I'm going to see what's still at the scene. Is, is everything gone? Uh, the police car? The van? I started out wanting to be an actor, but I really had no desire to go to New York City or L.A. Television seemed to be a perfect marriage of journalism and the world of acting. You're ready, Larry, 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 Larry. I'm ready. You're ready, Chris. I'm ready. As Larry prepares to go live, he notices an unusual police presence at the scene. We see a couple of district chiefs. We see some captains and some sergeants. The Woods automatically sends up a red flag that maybe there's some element to this that makes this even more serious than your typical accident. Cops coming on 14. The van has a stop sign, and the van pulls out in front. Okay. Could it be that the officer was either killed or, or he may be at fault? It shouldn't be that much longer. Okay, we'll hang loose then. All right. But the police on scene are not exactly forthcoming. People in our traffic investigations that what they are in the process of doing is recreating the accident. They will be able to determine what exactly transpired here. Are there serious injuries to the officer as well as people in the van, or what? what's your understanding? The assignment editor makes a last-ditch effort to get any information from the police. They're not saying much about what it is. They, yeah, there's an accident. Yeah, they got a lot of people there, but they don't say who's hurt, what happened. Cops are kind of hanky. So something's going on. She's there. So. You're watching Colorado's News Channel. As the lead for the noon broadcast, Larry has to get on the air with what little he knows. Now, I'm told that the police officer was going to help another officer. Officer. We don't know what the need of that other officer was. There's a lot of information that we still don't know. What can we say? What do we not say? We're going to stick here for a while and see what else we can learn. We'll get back to you. You just tell what you know, what you see. You can't, you know, just be saying things to look like good TV. With the initial report on the air, Larry's job of figuring out what happened has only begun. Terrible 
accident, though. For reporters at KCNC, bearing witness to a tragedy like this is often part of their workday. But that reality doesn't keep one reporter from taking her chances on the road. Yeah, I'm the biker chick reporter. This would be a Harley. Very loud. I'd never ridden a motorcycle till I started dating my husband. And I just love it. It's so fun. See you later. Good boy. It's just such a fallacy that black leather and loud bikes mean bad people. At 52, Linda Benzel has been in television news for over 20 years. I think I'm the oldest person on the air at this station. To the studio. Five o'clock news. But I guess I'm kind of young at heart. Somebody's butt pad. In addition to being a reporter, Linda is also a weekend anchor. Anchoring is significantly easier than reporting. Here we go. Parents of Columbine victims back a bill to most of the stuff is written for you. So all you have to do is read it off the teleprompter. News for this is Linda. Reporting's a lot different. To be a good reporter, you have to be a jack of all trades, master of none. Reporter Larry Blunt is at the scene of the accident involving a police car. And we don't have names of the two victims yet, do we, the civilians? But many details remain unknown. Big bad nasty accident, 14th and Dahlia. You guys getting any people in from that yet? Finally, from the hospital, they learn the condition of the victims. So is the cop still alive? The cop is in serious condition. Two people he hit, gone. A Denver police officer is involved in a deadly accident. We'll head back live to the scene. Are you sure he's a police officer and not a sheriff? Sure. Maybe like the chief. Or With two fatalities, identifying the police officer involved becomes a priority. Brian can find out. Yeah, he would be the guy. Brian. The news team turns to their crime reporter, who's in tight with the cops. Brian, can you call some people? Stay here. All right, appreciate it. Bye bye. Back at the scene, one question is on everyone's mind. Did you hear a siren? Basically, I heard a siren and I heard like a crash, like it was the trash dumpster. Did you hear the license siren when you were in the basement? I, I can't give you, no, I can't say that I did or not. That's all. Oh, really? We think it's him. We're not sure, though. The crime reporter has returned with a name for the injured officer. I'm talking to Brian. He says it might be Billy Gallegos. We need to confirm that with Virginia. It's a name once well known throughout Colorado. Billy Gallegos lived in Pueblo, Colorado, and it was one of the America held hostage, one of the hostages in Iran in 1979. Yeah, I remember doing that story. Veteran reporter Paul Day steps into work this new development. I have kind of a long history with Billy Gallegos. Gallegos that goes back more than 20 years. Pretty solid with this. But he can't come, he wouldn't go on the airways. Early in his career, Paul Day extensively covered the story of Billy Gallegos and his fellow captives. My recollection is some 50 American citizens were taken hostage in this Iranian embassy and held for 14 months. It was huge. It was all still too. With 10 minutes left in the noon broadcast, the news team is anxious to get this latest discovery on the air. We haven't confirmed that it's him, though. We have not confirmed that it's him at all. Do you have enough information in your brain that you'd be able to tell a little bit about him, like 30 or 45 seconds just in the newsroom chair? So we're going to confirm this in 10 minutes? We're going to try to, yeah. We've got people everywhere trying to do it. That's it, right there. That's the stuff. Billy Gallegos was a Marine guard from Colorado defending the American embassy when it was overrun by Iranian militants. We've called the manager of safety. We've called the mayor's office. And who else can we brainstorm? Who else should we talk to? What's interesting about Gallegos is that he caught criticism for making statements on Iranian television that seemed to be defending his treatment at the hands of his captors. Most of all, uh I mean, you see a kid so young being caught up as an international news figure, and, and you wonder, you know, what's he going to do with his life? You know, where's he going to go with it? You know, and he clearly wanted to go into law enforcement. This happens. I've met him a couple times, too. He's a real nice guy. But he's had enough misery in his life. Boy. Yeah, I need the media relations, please. Media relations, please. Thank you. Okay, say again. 
With so little time left in the broadcast, Paul will go on air the moment they get a confirmation. We still don't have it, but we may get it in a few minutes. What did he say? Are we going to get a name here soon? What did she say? Does Rihanna know I'm in here? Okay, just relax. They're not sure yet. It is Billy, for sure. They have confirmation that it is Gallegos. We have an update now on our top story on this date. Right now, let's go to our Paul Day. He's at the studio. We've just received word from the mayor's office that the police officer injured in this crash is Billy Gallegos. And if that's a name that sounds familiar to some people in Colorado, it should be because... I feel sorry for Gallegos because this is the last thing I know he wanted. He does not want any attention brought on himself. So this is quite a development that the officer injured today is Billy Gallegos. Paul Day, thank you very much. You can tell when you've got a good story, the floor crew, people that see news all day long suddenly are paying attention to a story. Billy Gallegos is in stable condition and will go on to recover. I'm trying to find out. But there's still more to the story. That's what you call right away. Hello? Larry learns new information about the two victims that makes this story even more tragic. A Denver police cruiser and a minivan collided, killing a man and a woman today. News 4's Larry Blunt is live at the point of impact with more on the couple who died. Larry? We've just learned that the name of the couple who died here at this intersection is Robert and Georgia Gardner. The police officer, Billy Gallegos, was responding to an emergency call when he broadsided the minivan. But the details of that call remain unknown. Let me know if you hear anything on that, okay? We do know that it was an officer needing help. I don't know what exactly, why the officer needed help. Hello? Larry learns from the station that the victims may not have heard the approaching siren. They'd heard, but it's not confirmed yet. The two victims were deaf people. Four blocks south of where you're at right now is a church called Church of Christ. They were janitors at that church. Oh, they were what? cleaning the church this morning and left the church to go home after cleaning, and that's when the accident happened. How do they get out? How do they yield to emergency vehicles, just generally? Oh, it's really sad. Oh, very sad. Yeah. For Larry, these two anonymous victims are as much a part of the story as the illustrious injured officer. One thing I do not want to do is leave people just as in statistics. Accident victim number 101 and 102 died today. No, that's, that's not what the story is about. Tell us about Robert and Georgia. The minister of the church, where most of the congregation is deaf, knew the victims well. What were they like? Uh, they were both really sweet people. People liked them a lot. Their hearing may have played a role in this accident. I don't think so, because deaf people watch where they go. They always the minister saying no surprised me, but his explanation that deaf people, because they've lost that sense of hearing, they are much more attentive with their eyes. That made sense to me. I saw something had to have gotten in the way. Something strange had to have happened here. I don't know what happened. I really okay. don't know. Thanks for taking the time. You're Appreciate welcome. it. Thank you. When you hear about these people, what great people they were, to me it adds to the, the sadness of the whole story. Call Norm at the desk. Again? It wasn't that he was in trouble, they just couldn't locate him. As a last twist to this story, Larry learns that the emergency call of an officer needing assistance was just a false alarm. That officer was simply an officer that the police department was worried about, that they hadn't seen him in a while, and it was shortly after this accident happened that uh, they, the officer called in to the station. All right, thanks, Larry Blunt. For Larry, reporting on this final piece of the puzzle draws the story to a close. What, what else needs to be said? You pray for the families and let them heal. It is breaking news. Thanks for understanding. Back at the station, another story is breaking. We have uh, potential breaking news. That's it. Cop shooting again in Lakewood. There's been a shootout in Lakewood, an otherwise quiet suburban town west of Denver. Police have sealed off the neighborhood, and an all-out manhunt is underway. It's the second police shooting in Lakewood in three days. Only days before, another Lakewood officer was shot and seriously wounded. Go, Christina. 
The station sends reporter Christina Yao to cover this breaking news. We're going to be going to a veterinary hospital in Lakewood. It seems like that's where a police officer was shot. This is going to be a developing story, so I have to... When a story calls for digging, that's the kind of story I like. You get out of the truck and you assess the situation. What's there and what's not there? Is there a chase right now? Can you tell me if there's a... The PIO is on her way. Okay. The investigators at the scene are not ready for reporters. Christina looks for anyone to talk to. Sir, can you tell me what happened here? I was in the, the room with a client and we heard the, the window pane shatter and some shots. And I looked out the window and, and saw a policeman who had been shot. One leg was dragging and the other leg was, uh, was okay. And he was, had his gun out trying to get a shot at the suspect. Wow. The cops in serious condition shot three times in the leg. The suspect's on the sprint, two of them, right? Police say it may be the same two brothers or suspects in a Sunday morning officer shooting a leg. Can you tell me what happened in Sunday's shooting? Sunday's shooting began when an officer stopped two young men. They shot him in the leg. One guy got in the patrol car and drove off. The cop then fired at his own patrol car and blew out a tire. Blew out a tire, and then the other, then the guy ran from there. Their names are Lopez, and we have a still start. Thank you. These guys are bad dudes. It was in the paper. They're all their their, their prior record. If they're not afraid to shoot cops, I shot you guys before. I'll shoot you again. What are they looking for? Yeah, we're missing some evidence that might be right in this area. So, back at the scene, Christina begins to piece together the details of the shootout. It turns out the man in the red striped shirt is the wounded officer's partner. I overheard the partner explain to another cop what happened. He was saying, gosh, I didn't know what to do. You know, I feel terrible. The officer and his partner had stopped a young man who matched a description from Sunday's shooting. They were patting him down when he began to struggle. They never saw a gun. Apparently the gun was in the gunman's sleeve, so he never saw it. They never saw it. It took them by surprise. With cop shooters still on the loose, anything could happen. Lakewood police continue their manhunt for two cop shooters. He was last seen in the area of 70 South Zephyr, a Hispanic male wearing a black down jacket and blue jeans. They expand their search to nearby fields. Police just said the field north of Allison checks clear. The exhaustive manhunt has the whole neighborhood under siege. They won't let us get her out. And Christina learns from a nervous parent that neighborhood schools have been locked down. Imagine nobody can get through. You can't come in, and the cops aren't letting the kids out unless they're sick. All right, I gotta go meet Bob Burke because we're going to the schools. Okay. Bob Burke, please meet Linda Benzel down in front of the station. Linda Benzel takes on this side of the story. We've got a major crime scene up here right in the middle of Lodgewood with a lot of witnesses. This isn't the first time that this neighborhood has chosen to lock down its schools. This happens to be in the same county that the Columbine High School shooting occurred, so everyone's a little on edge. The school is locked down. No one's able to enter this area and this area here. Almost looks like a war zone with all the helicopters around. But no, I've never seen anything like this in my life. With two gunmen loose in the neighborhood, frantic parents rush to the school. I'm really concerned about my daughter. She's yeah. only six. Okay. All right, and you're going to just take her to work with you? I'm going to take her to work with me. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mom looks more scared than the little girl. I mean, it'd be frightening, especially with what happened here in the last April in Columbine. Columbine is still very much on all of our minds. It sounds like they're pretty worried about these guys. I don't think you can go through that kind of a community trauma and not look at everything like, oh my God, please don't let it happen again. It's kind of eerie. Uh, this time of day, this, this playground would be full of laughing, screaming children. For viewers in Denver, not every story coming over the airwaves is breaking news. Some stories are simply about how they can best spend their hard-earned dollar. There is a definite appetite among our viewership for consumer-oriented stories. 
Reporter Paul Day heads out to do a consumer piece about a very special tire. It's an assignment personally handed down by the station's news director. The boss is very afraid of being stranded on a highway by a flat tire. She describes it as a phobia. She heard about a tire built to withstand nail punctures, and she suggested that I test them. It looks pretty good. Just make sure there's even pressure all the way around. You try and imagine, as the reporter, how would John Q. Public evaluate this tire? I want to get you driving over nails. OK. To be honest with you, I don't want to be the daily consumer guy. But it's a chance to do shtick. All the construction in Denver leaves nails on the roads. But imagine driving over something like this. We had 32 pounds pressure in here before, and we've got even more air pressure than we started with. That's impressive. With the nail test unsuccessful, Paul decides to take a more direct approach. What do you call this device? We call them road fangs. Road fangs. Spikes used to stop high-speed chases. Well, this will be interesting to see if the state patrol can do what we can. Cop shooters continues in residential Lakewood. Finally, one suspect is apprehended. I think they may have the shooter. Yeah. So you're still looking for the second suspect, right? Okay. These are the same suspects from the shooting on Sunday. The I.O. said out there. They were having an on back and forth, and now they say they're the same. At the scene, KCNC competitors are setting up for live shots. They're finally here. It's one of those things where if we get something and they don't, then in the newsroom there's a, you know, yeah, we got them this time. Hey, Julie, how are you? Fine. Right now we have SWAT teams, K-9 officers. Channel 9, KCNC's main competition, is first to go live from the scene. We have not sent a live truck. Okay, John. We need to send a truck Tom, out there. Someone needs, I mean, we have not rolled a truck. truck yet. We're sending a live truck so we can do a special report interrupting programming. Really? So. KCNC now has to play catch up. What's your advice on speed? I would try this at about 50 miles an hour, not much faster. Best Paul Day gets last minute advice before driving over road fangs. You're not going to lose control, but you're obviously going to bump over something. Just hang on. Hang on. Okay. Okay. Did I hit it? Oh, yeah. You hit it. Still holding 34 pounds pressure. This is embarrassing. <sighs> I'm not sure where we go with this, because we're showing bad guys the tire to buy now. Well, let's try it again. They try one last time. That's the sound we've been waiting for all day long. The fact that it went through with no effect the first time is more a function of good tires or bad fangs. I don't know. Despite appearances, the tire is not through with Paul yet. Where's the hole? Nothing. It sealed itself. The tire has resealed itself. <laughs> That's, That's an impressive pounds. tire, huh? Man, this is spectacular. I think a lot of people are going to have their eyes wide open. Christina is going to give us an update on this in a few minutes. With their competition already on the air, KCNC has decided to do a live report on the cop shooting. We're going to do a break in at 10.30. We have five minutes. Hey, Jackie, confirm with Christina that these are the same suspects from Sunday. That's what Dale told me that the PIO said. But confirm with her. That is confirmed, Doug. Christina said the PIO said that. Hi, Mike. It's Jackie. We're about two and a half away. Your shot comes first. Only moments before Christina's live break-in, something catches her attention. Hey, Leroy. Okay, here we go, here we go. I notice, out of the corner of my eye, the PIO has come out. I've got some vague information on how this occurred this morning. Don, 
Oh my God, don't tell me that she's coming out now to give an update three minutes before the newscast. I'm thinking I have to go and get the, the freshest information. The officer who was shot um, was making contact with the suspect who shot him twice in the leg. With the live shot imminent, Christina doesn't have time to listen to the rest of the update. And just now we're hearing that the officer who was shot is in serious condition, but not with any life-threatening injuries. And she misses critical information about the suspects. Now they're saying that they don't think it's one of the Lopez brothers that we were looking for. The police have told us that today's suspects are the same people that they're looking for in that case. One of those suspects is Danny Lopez, the other is Dustin Lopez. KCNC ends up reporting that today's suspects are the same ones from Sunday's shooting. We're not sure if there is, in fact, a second suspect or not. Okay, so it may not be then. Okay, the PIO just uh, said that she doesn't think it's in relation to the Lopez brothers. Okay, so she had all wrong information. Oh, f All right, thank you. Bye. I can't believe it. The station's worst fear has come true. They broadcasted misinformation. Well, you know, what do you do? Just talk to her. You guys, everybody should know not the Lopez brothers at all. She totally was wrong earlier. When you're going live in a situation like that, you have to expect that mistakes will be made. It's beyond your control. You know that you tried to get the latest information the best you could. With the sole cop shooter finally in custody, the neighborhood returns to normal. They have called off the search. Okay, here the kids are coming out of school. Do you see them? Here they come. The problem with television news is that we've sacrificed time and depth to speed, getting more on the air, next, next, next. But really, all of us just want to put the very best product on the air. Okay. Today is reporter Linda Benzel's lucky day. KCNC wants her to report on the latest Harley Davidson product on the market. <laughs> I love this. This is too so cute. cute. This was put together by a qualified Harley mechanic. So this is a fun this place a fun. to be. You know, you smell the leather. Doing this consumer piece is Linda's chance to spread her personal passion to her audience. Everyone says that reporters need to be objective, but there is no objective reporter on earth. We all have our biases and our feelings. <laughs> what was your name? Linda Benzel. Linda? This is my son, Tommy. Hi, Tommy. This is Linda. Tommy, you want to get on that, baby? Would ya? That's what mommy wants to get you. That's your Harley. Despite his initial fear, little Tommy is coaxed into testing out the bike. I've got it in low speed. Careful, he knows how to drive one. He's had one since he's nine months old. Don't crash, go forward. Don't watch the <laughs> you don't want to do that. You got to take big, wide turns, okay, bud? Slow and easy. Watch out, folks. But we were lucky. Isn't it cute? TV news sometimes makes people feel like everything's so bad. And really, there are a lot of good things. And I think that's important to let people know that. Whoa! That kid keeps popping into high gear. He does want speed. That's frightening. <laughs> you like going fast? Yeah. How come? I don't want to. Today's adventure with little Tommy is an uncommon one for Linda. The only time I ever really wanted kids was when I was pregnant, and I lost three babies. So I figured, three strikes, I'm out. Okay. But that's all right. You know, I have a lot of children in my life, and I'm still pretty childlike myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's cute. That will be a great story. Um, I thought you'd appreciate it. Yes. <laughs> The sun shines 300 days a year in Denver, Colorado. It's truly an outdoor paradise. But when the weather turns, the change can be fast and furious. The winter storm warning that's posted by the Weather Service is already issued for now until noon tomorrow. When a big snowstorm is predicted for the Denver area... I'm keeping watch on Mountain Cam. KCNC pulls out all the stops. Do I have all my trucks today? All right. Let's list out all our live locations, okay? So reporter-wise, we have Benzel, Day, Fearburg, 
that's three. And then somebody in town. We do get a little nuts about snow. I'm just making a tape list so we have other stuff. Any kind of weather phenomenon, people in Colorado just go crazy. I'm going to finish my hot chocolate. Probably the last thing I'll get to eat for 24 hours. And when we get the news for Spirit of Colorado hat out, um, we're talking major snow. The weather in Denver seems to change more dramatically, or more violently than in other places. This is a Bauer Polar Parka. I mean, we're talking like two inches of down here, and it's the hood that really makes the difference. I mean, you know, this is made for polar expeditions. What starts out is a mild and meek snowstorm can get 12, 16, 24 inches of snow in 12 hours. Are they going to get ready to go out and... Let's go! <laughs> Today is my day off, and I got a page. So I'm thinking, okay, blizzard. This better be a blizzard. If the foothills is supposed to get two feet of snow, there better be a lot of snow between now and tomorrow morning. The history of goofy hats in this form, that one looks really good. Thank you. 90 seconds, Frank. I need you centered up and head and shoulders for a triple box. Good afternoon, Paul. Hello, Jim. You know, as you head west out of Denver along I-70... Denver has a disproportionate number of car commuters. So everybody worries about the weather. And everybody's affected by it. We're going to keep a close eye on it out here. And I'm Linda Benzel. I'm out near Park Meadows Mall. We'll give you an idea of the very windy and cold conditions out here. Linda has her own theory as to why KCNC viewers are so interested in a snowstorm. They want to see someone out showing you how cold it is and how miserable it is. And aren't they glad they're at home watching TV? Okay, you're next. Stand by. Instead of standing alongside I-25 in a gale. <laughs> and it's very, very windy, very cold. And we've got what we're calling sideways snow. Trust me, it really okay. is as unpleasant as it looks. Can't feel my thumbs. Right now, we have crews out all across the Front Range and the mountains as well. Christina will spend the night in a hotel in the foothills so she can be up at dawn to do a live shot. Maybe by tomorrow morning, it's going to be a mess out here. But in the morning, guess how much snow was on the ground? All of three inches. We had predicted that there would be two feet of snow out here, but I have to tell you, I was at this spot last night, and what you see at my feet right here, if we can, I could not believe there was only one more inch of snow. Probably two inches here. That's it. Traffic is moving along just fine. So I get there, I'm thinking, how am I going to fill five live shots? on oh, nothing. <laughs> but you have to do it. Now, at the most, maybe two inches on the ground. There just isn't very much accumulation, maybe two inches. It is still snowing out here, but it's a light, flaky snow. If you look down at my feet, you'll see at most there's three inches of accumulation on the ground. But at least you could say it's snowing. <laughs> I don't care how good the weather guessers tell you they are. We all find out together what these storms are going to do. Look at that! Look at that! <laughs> she just blew that light at 50 miles an hour! Look at it! Salinger. Reporter Rick Salinger, a former CNN correspondent, has witnessed firsthand some of the world's biggest events. I always enjoy covering the biggest stories in the world, and I do miss that. We'll see how much longer this thing's going to go. And fortunately, we've had a great deal of news here in Denver that would qualify as international news, and I've been involved in almost all of that. Rick's been covering a story of a young boy accused of a serious crime. A Swiss-American boy accused of molesting his sister at their home in Evergreen was back in court this afternoon. It's been almost three months since 11-year-old Raul was arrested after a neighbor reported seeing him fondle his little sister. Now he faces felony charges of incest and sexual assault on a minor. Raul says he did not do anything. There was nothing in the sexual contact, and I believe he'll be exonerated if we ever get to trial. Thank you. Since the arrest, Raul has been separated from his parents who fled the country fearing their other children would also be taken away. 
Um, this is a story of the international interest. All these people have come from European uh, media. In Switzerland, you would, you would certainly not have been handcuffed. That's not done for an for a 11 year old. There's been an outcry in Europe over the treatment of Raoul, who was taken away in handcuffs and jailed for seven weeks before being placed in a foster home. This case is blown out of proportion completely. In Europe, we just laugh and we're so mad we want to cry. Let the boy go home. This child needs therapy from the abuse that the state has done to him. You know, I agree with her 100% on this 11-year-old and handcuffs and shackles. I'll leave uh, my opinions till after it's all done. They just can't let it go. They can't let While it go. While he remains objective in his reporting, Rick finds himself drawn into the story. It's a real-life drama. At first, it just seemed natural to me what was taking place. The boys accused of a crime, they go and arrest them, they put them through the system like any other person accused of a crime. But when I sat in the courtroom and saw this little boy sitting between these big lawyers, while the lawyers are arguing his fate, he's drawing pictures with colored pencils. Then it really struck me that this is indeed a child, and I imagine my own son sitting there and how horrible that would be to judge what the uh, truth is in this case but it's got to be very painful to everybody involved we have a new story a thousand fake pokemon cards a report comes into kcnc about a surprising counterfeit scam where's the hero Larry meets the sleuth who alerted local authorities about the phony cards. Dad. Other discoveries of fake Pokemon cards have been posted on the internet. And I saw this article that said, uh, watch out for cards that look different from all the others. And I just got this few out. They were look looking kind of weird and I tested them all and they were all fake. I just told my parents and at first they didn't believe me. But then, <laughs> now, now the real one, you can't see through it at all. Okay. Only a little bit. And here's the fake one. Oh. When you did this, what did you think? Wow, all these cards are fake. I'm getting a rip off. <laughs> <laughs> It was one of those kinds of stories that you can have fun because thank goodness it's not like it involves death or people getting hurt. Good deal. Good job, buddy. Thanks. Great. He was smooth. Reporter Rick Salinger is covering the case of an 11-year-old boy accused of incest. You can't get him. He returns to the courthouse to discover the judges closed the courtroom to the media. Judge James Zimmerman attacked the press coverage of the case, particularly from the foreign media, saying they're interested not so much in the interests of the boy, but rather to vilify the judicial system of this state. Jim? For Rick, Raul's treatment by the authorities has made this more than just another trial story. If nothing else, this whole episode made me think to myself, boy, are we really dealing with juveniles? in the best way possible. Sure it's not the boy, huh? However he may feel about the case, Rick still has to cover the story the best he can. Which way did the boy come in last time? Um, last time he just came in. Right here? Yeah. We're gonna uh, look for the boy to come into the uh, courthouse. Now, I really don't have any intention of showing the boy's face, but if we can get some sort of shot that doesn't reveal his identity, it's something that we can use. Rick's not the only one keeping an eye out for Raul. You know, look at this guy's pointing here. Here comes the stamp. It's only a false alarm. There's nothing, right? Whether he likes it or not, Rick has become part of the media mob. I gotta tell you, I feel very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. This is an 11-year-old boy charged with incest. I really hope he doesn't come in this way. I really don't. Excuse me. Excuse me. I've got a jockey for a position where I can get the microphone. The trial for Raul is set to begin behind closed doors. Well, the boy is in there, I understand. 
Ja, Stefan, ich versuch's mal was. Word spreads among the reporters that the defense has filed a motion to have the case dismissed on a technicality. We don't know what the story is until they come out of there. We're herded up against the door here. And when they come out, there's gonna be a mad crush. And nobody's really gonna get much of anything. There's Raul. It's already been three months since Raul last saw his family. How much longer is think? I, I don't know. If the judge refuses to dismiss the case, there's no telling how long the trial will drag on. The story is taken out of life, and we don't know the ending for it yet. As the next newscast approaches, reporter Linda Benzel assumes her other role. Hair, makeup, blah. That of an anchor. Guys can do glasses, girls can. Not an industry that is terribly fair to people. Okay, war paint. Linda's days of putting on makeup may soon be coming to an end. I've been in television news since 1977. I'm now 52 years old. That's kind of a scary place to be. There's not much you can do to stop the aging process. They've uh, already made it pretty clear that I'm not going anywhere here. Um, except for weekend mornings because uh, I applied for you know some some shifts on the day side and didn't get them so handwriting's on the wall but I actually had an ex-husband tell me he was no longer attracted to me because I was too old too fat and couldn't have children so after that you know it's like oh geez they passed me over what a ch what a what a problem <laughs> what a blow Thanks for joining us on First News today. Another beautiful day here in Denver. Absolutely. Actually, we're going to go right now to uh, Jennifer Zeppelin. Despite hitting the twilight of her career, Linda remains a survivor. I can anchor. I can report. I can field produce. Hi, Doc. The more versatile you make yourself, the more chance you have of staying in the job. So, I hope. We'll be back. <laughs> Now two and a half hours into this one hour hearing and still no resolution. I can't stand up anymore. My legs are getting tired. What happened, Ms. Moses? I have no comment. What did the judge do with the, the motion? Unexpectedly, the defense lawyers head outside. The media follow closely behind. On the courthouse steps, the lawyers prepare to make a statement. Bob, are you here? Okay, okay. The court, pursuant to our motion to dismiss for violation of speedy trial, has dismissed the case. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll go back live to the Jefferson County Justice Center where Rick Salinger has the latest. So the charges have been dismissed. It is now expected Raul will be let go and will travel to Switzerland to join his parents where they fled after his arrest. And so the story comes to an end. See you later, guys. I see myself as a piece of a puzzle that helps people understand things better. And they remember whether they believed you or didn't believe you or trusted you. And that's a gift that the audience gives you. So you respect that and you respect them in kind. Yeah, one of these guys might be able to help you. Being a reporter is just the best education. You know, you cannot teach what I've learned about human nature and about how people will, will react in crisis. It can be a very frantic business, but I feel lucky because of the knowledge that I've been able to attain, the people I've been able to meet. It's amazing what goes on out there. Okay, Bayad, thanks. When you get so involved in a particular uh, story, it's hard to get it out of your mind, even if the work is done. Raul has got to uh, continue to live his life. Uh, but we're going to go on to something new, and this will all be uh, a memory. major breaking story right now in Denver. All hell just broke loose, actually. This story's big. It's suspicious. They got a horseback search going out there. Two more of Denver's homeless are found murdered in Lower Downtown. Hi, Brian Moss. Can you hear me? We are going to come to you soon. 
Okay, well, we got a murder scene to go to. You better boogie. storm is gathering over Denver, Colorado. There's a serial killer out there. A lot of times I dream about these murders. It's about some of my friends that were killed. Someone is brutally murdering Denver's homeless. Five transients in the last month have been beaten to death, bludgeoned to death area near Coors Field. I'm scared to death. Because we have nothing but rocks and sticks, and that's rocks it. Rocks and sticks. There are fears that this is a serial killer who's working in Denver. Is it outsiders? Is it other homeless people? Nobody knows. To the local media, this is one of the biggest stories of the year. Uh, today we're here to announce $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of persons that are responsible for the deaths of five homeless men in the past two months. People turn up dead along the South Platte River in hobo camps, and it, it's sad, but in any big city, life is cheap downtown. Veteran reporter Terry Jessup is covering the story for KCNC-TV in Denver. A break in the search for a Cortez police officer's killers. KCNC News 4 broadcasts seven and a half hours of daily news throughout Colorado. This is based on 5 Go. The station's news desk is Command Central. Information often comes through here first. Is there a bus on its side or anybody you heard that you can see? But before any information becomes news... Go, 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 go! It must wind its way through the controlled chaos of the newsroom. I know, it's been corrected. The assignment editors. Is somebody writing that? Are you writing this? Producers. I just want to start with the, the newest no, stuff right off the top. Anchors. 30 seconds. All work closely together to produce each news hour. 15. Stand by to roll your tape, Frank. Sound is off FS2. On time. 10 seconds. And without a hitch. Here we go, stand by. But on the front line of television news are the reporters. Here at the Capitol today, here at the Capitol today is the roll cue to the VO. After more than 20 years in the news business, Terry Jessup remains passionate about being a reporter. It's like an electrical cord. You just grab it and it tugs you along and you see the most amazing things and sometimes it burns you, but it's never boring. But how else would I get to interview the last four presidents? It's amazing. Every Newsday begins with a morning story meeting. We had that big story on at the phone company the other day saying they were going to get better. This guy who's been waiting for 14 months might be a good story. Filling seven and a half hours of programming a day is a constant challenge. Jim, we need a lead story. What do you got? And KCNC reporters span the city, working on a wide range of stories. I sense fire. 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 You hang out here pretty often? Yeah. yeah who did you know that's uh, been arrested? You know what daylight savings is when you change the clocks? Would you like to see year-round daylight savings? Yes. All right, so lead for tonight. But it's the hottest stories of the day that drive the newscast. I just think that homeless story I was watching that four story. days ago and I said, nobody cares about the homeless. The $100,000 reward has escalated the homeless murder story. I think we need to get in this homeless story. We'll be over it until some the next dead guy shows up. Reporting on the homeless murders for the 5 p.m. news is Terry's chance to play a role in this mystery. You catch some bad guys once in a while. I heard Paul Newman say that in a movie about the media, but it's true. Think I'm right, then I'm right. The murders of five homeless men, all brutally killed in the same area of downtown Denver, have the city on edge. A serial killer may be out there, and Terry hits the streets to find out. Is there any definitive motive on any of them? We're looking at different angles. We're looking at robbery. We're looking at just emotion. We don't have any evidence that is directing us in one 
particular direction or another. If the police have any leads, they're not letting on. Some of the things that we are doing, I really can't discuss. There has been some talk that a lot of these homeless people have anti-schizophrenic medication and there could be somebody attacking them to get hold of that. Does that make any sense at all? That's a possibility. Folks who are, are homeless who have mental health problems may have some limited medications. The police are not the only source of information. You've heard this theory. These are thrill killings. This may be a serial killer. We've heard reports from other communities that, uh, that this can happen, but never anything like this. What are you hearing from the people who come here now? How much fear is there? It scares me, man. I kind of look over myself when I'm out there sleeping on these streets. And you think these are thrill killings? Yeah, they done knocked, them out, knocked a lot of these older guys out. Could be late, could be thrill killings, could be a serial killer. Uh, could just be happenstance. And we interviewed a guy on the street who thinks it's another homeless person versus the police who... Think it's someone targeting homeless Keeping pace with every developing news story requires around-the-clock attention. News 4, this is Chris. We have got a home run slam dunk for 10 o'clock. Chris Schabel is a nightside reporter for the 10 p.m. news. I consider this my hometown. My parents still live in Boulder, Colorado. Police also say the investigation is ongoing and no one has been ruled out. So whenever I do a story, I'm not just telling the audience, I'm telling my parents. Chris has a unique family background. I have always known that I was adopted. It's a good thing they told me, because I would have figured it out anyway. I'm the only African-American child in a white family. And I think it's a credit to how I was raised that I don't look at the world through white eyes or black eyes. I look at the world through human eyes. Chris follows up on an ongoing story about a missing child. He wants to report on the family's latest plea for help from the public. We're doing an interview with um, Alan Adadero, who's the father of Jared Adadero, little boy who was missing in the mountains of Colorado and has never been found. It's been an entire month since three-year-old Jared disappeared. He was on a hiking trip with some friends and said he was going to run forward, and he never made it. Something happened, he got off the trail, and he never made it. This is a story that Chris has been drawn to since he first reported it. For seven straight days, would-be rescuers searched for Jared Adadero. They found one set of child tracks mixed with both a mountain lion and a bear, but found little else. We probably turned over every stone we could think of. It's a mystery. Chris Schauble, News 4. Hey, Alan. How you doing? We were wondering if we could nab you and bring you downstairs. Yeah. Alan Adadero still hasn't given up hope, and now has taken out an ad in the local paper to remind people that his son may still be alive. We're the first ones to do something on this in terms of a story? Or? You're the first ones to even see it. Can you read me the little top portion of it? My name is Jared Adedero and I'm still missing. Please keep your eyes open. There's no evidence I'm on the mountain. And maybe somebody did take him thinking he was just a lost little boy and he needed a home. And I'm hoping somebody's taking care of him. They really do. He's doing what a parent would want to do. You're doing the right thing because, you know, the more you keep it in the public eye, you know. the more people care. You know? and, <laughs> You know, I'll probably be doing a story with you every so often. I would do anything in my power to help Mr. Adedero. I can only wonder what it would be like to lose a child. The least I can do is um, help him get his story on the air. How many people do you think are involved? Terry Jessup has gathered all the information he can about the homeless murders. He now must pull the elements of his story together. For Terry, being a reporter is all about being a good storyteller. That's, that's what keeps me going. If this isn't good, if it's poorly written, it's all on me. I've got no excuse. Test, one, two, three, four. Doug Simmons believes the killer is just like him, homeless. Before discovering his passion for reporting, Terry was already accustomed to performing under pressure. I boxed golden gloves and traveled all over the country, Madison Square Garden, the Feld Forum. I got a room full of trophies and a crooked nose, but I never got the big paycheck. Down the corridor where good men die like dogs. <laughs> Find the editor and breathe life into this. 
The head of Denver's homicide unit won't say there's a serial killer at work, but won't deny it either. While the editor assembles the package, Terry heads downtown to do a live shot for the 5 p.m. broadcast. Can you hear me, Stacy? Terry, you were probably about a minute 30 away. I still get nervous on live shots. Move over that way. Some people think if you've had years and years of doing it, it's like riding a bicycle. Well, you can fall off. Live shots are an article of faith. Each one is different and uh, has its own host of technical gremlins. The live shot is the final element Terry needs to complete his story. Stand by camera two. Here we go. Stand by, they're going to take us. But there's a problem. We got audio problems with Terry Joseph. Do they need us to move somewhere? Is there nothing we can do? We still have about a minute. Do they want us to move somewhere? Okay, Terry, at this point, we're not taking a shot. Although disappointed in not getting his full story across, Terry is used to the reality of local news. It happens a lot in live television. I can't explain it. It's magic to me. Good evening, everyone. I'm Larry Block. And I'm Kathy Walsh. They're doing it right now. Terry can only listen on as the remnant of his story is aired. Police do say most crime within Denver's homeless community is territorial, revenge-oriented, rarely directed at possession. Somebody's seeing something, but... Ain't nobody saying nothing. All five of the victims were homeless, all struck with a blunt object, all killed in Lodo, most within sight of Coors Field. And while the police won't even say the murders are linked, Denver's homeless hang close to the downtown shelters, adding fear as another thread in their too common web of problems. As another day draws to a close, KCNC viewers learn that a killer is still at large. Denver, Colorado, a commercial center for the Rocky Mountain region, a haven for those seeking a more wholesome lifestyle. But the Mile High City is facing a menacing problem. Five homeless men have been bludgeoned to death downtown. KCNC-TV closely monitors every development. You for the stug? Yes, hi. Finally, there's a break in the case. And well, you're only looking at this one homicide. He's a 20-year-old transient who is the suspect. It turns out that there's more than one suspect. Police have made three arrests in connection with one of the homeless murders from September. The suspects, Nathan Harrison, Thomas Holden, and Chris Ball, are just three among hundreds of young homeless in Denver. For many of them, their only home is downtown 16th Street Mall. The locals have given these young homeless a name, the Mall Rats. There's going to be a bunch of Mall Rats come down the hallway here in just a little while. <laughs> I have to get in front of these guys and back them and hopefully not hit a wall. In addition to the three murder suspects, five other so-called Mall Rats have been arrested for attacks on older homeless. As to their motive, there are only speculations. Hi, Alan. It's Chris Schauble again. Reporter Chris Schauble has been closely covering the story of Jared Adadero, the boy who disappeared while hiking in the mountains. When did you become aware of it? Mm -hmm. Now, from the boy's father, uh -huh. Chris gets a potential lead. Park Ranger Mesa Verde says he saw Jared Adazero with an unknown male figure three days after he first became missing. That's what I have to do a phoner and find out. If this turns out to be a good tip, Jared may still be alive. Sunday, after Jared became missing, a park ranger spotted a man and a young child in a hazardous area of Mesa Verde where there are age restrictions. He went over to him, pointed this out, said you need to, you know, go into a safer area. The so little boy wanted to grab his hand repeatedly. Never had that happen to him in the three years that he's been there. He remembers thinking that was odd. The next morning, the man and the boy are there at the park again, which he again thinks is odd. Why would these people be at the park at 9 a.m.? You guys discuss. That's everything I have. I question is the dad just trying to keep the story out of okay. And the answer to that, I'll just tell you right now, is yes. The question is, is what he's saying valid? Although Chris is excited to do the story, the producer and the news director 
have reservations. Yeah, it's a theory, but how often with, with missing children cases do we report theories? Yeah, we haven't. We gotta get somebody who's willing to put their face on it and say that they think that this is a possibility. Apart from Kid's father who was looking for any reason to keep the kid alive. Hi, Craig. My name's Chris Schauble with Channel 4 out of Denver. How are you tonight? Tell me what you saw. And you, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're a, a park ranger at Mesa Verde. Gotcha. Chris finally hears the ranger's account of the sighting. In your mind, on a scale of, say, 1 to 10, uh, 10 being that's Jared Adadero, where would you fall? He says 7. What is our story right now? I mean, if you were going on that, what is the lead to your story right now? If you were really going to just hit it in a simple sentence, Jared Adadero may not be dead and, in fact, may have been abducted. Even with suspects in custody, the motive behind the homeless murders remains a puzzle. You've got the cops saying, no, it's not a turf war. The cops saying it's not a turf war. Not a war. turf war, yeah. And then we read in the paper the next morning the exact opposite of what they tell us every day. Can't believe everything you read in the papers. Keeping up with the investigation of the homeless murders has become a team effort. I'm Rick Salinger. I'm a reporter KCNC TV, where I've been for the past six years. Rick Salinger is assigned to look into a rumor that the murders stem from a turf battle. You got two generations. You got the younger homeless, you got the older homeless, and apparently, we don't know the reason why, but the younger homeless are preying on the older ones and five people are dead. Hey, Stacy, did you see that the uh, charges were filed? Uh... The people that are being charged have been characterized as mall rats. The so-called mall rats have made quite an impression on Rick. I run into these people that usually wear a lot of uh, jewelry in their noses and their ears and their mouths, uh, punk-type haircuts, and are usually quite uh, inhospitable. Rick heads to the 16th Street Mall to interview some of the younger homeless. Last time I was down here and tried to talk to these people and they threw pop cans at me. So I guess Don's gonna have to be my bodyguard. Hi, Rick Salinger, Channel 4. Anything going on with these guys? Rick learns that the young homeless have been kicked off a park and onto an adjacent sidewalk. What do you think of the cops making everybody leave from down there? It's just plain harassment. It's a public park, people should be able to sit. It's because they consider us undesirable. Do you know the guys that have been arrested uh, in connection with uh, these? On that one. Um, I don't know them very well. I know a couple of them. Tommy and Alex were both my friends. In the hey, paper, I read that Does they had no proof. Ah, Alex and Tommy were a wicked clown. Do they have some problems with the older homeless people? No. No. Well, as one would expect, they're rejecting the uh, notion that their friends may have been responsible. Three, two, one. While police have their who, Hi! Hey, John. Hi! Hi! What's up, dog? Are we okay now? Yeah. While police believe they have their who, they're still not sure of the why the murders of the homeless people took place, and they're rejecting suggestions that this may have been a turf war. Whatever the motive may be, Denver's older homeless are resting more easily with the suspects behind bars. Now it seems like they're pretty much back to normal concerns. How cold will it be tonight? Where can I get some shelter if I have to? As a whole, the homeless population tend to be survivors. Jared's family thinks he's been kidnapped. They've got a park ranger to back up their theory. Chris has gotten the go-ahead to do a story on a possible sighting of Jared at Adaro, and he's feeling the pressure. There's a lot of things at stake with this story. Credibility, embarrassing the station, embarrassing even the family of Jared at Adaro. I just gotta be focused, accurate, and I'll be fine. There is no sign of Jared. The only sign in the mountains was a child's footprints mixed with the tracks of a mountain lion. The man that found those tracks, he followed the mountain lion for a ways, and he said, there's no sign of a struggle, there's no blood. He said, Alan, that cat never saw your son. Alan Adadero believes that the boy the ranger saw may have been Jared. The ranger was talking about how much this little boy wanted to hold his hand, and that's exactly what Jared would do. He is a big-time handholder, big-time handholder. He says on a scale of 1 to 10, he gives it a 7. 
I tell you what, being a teacher, 70% passes to me. See, I felt all along that they're looking more for reasons to stop looking for Jared than they are to keep looking for Jared. Alan Adadero is convinced that the authorities dismiss the importance of the sighting too quickly. They keep telling me probability, it's the least probability. Well, when you ask me about probability, what was the probability that that was the last day I'd seen my son, I'd have told you it's very small. Mm -hmm. Now Chris has to get another perspective. Hi, Sheriff. Hey, how you doing? That of the county sheriff who led the search. When it comes to balance, I have to have equal sentences, equal sound bites from the people who are on the opposing side. This boy that was seen at that time didn't act like he'd been crying, didn't act like he was fearful. If somebody were to have abducted Jared, it would be very unlikely that they would then expose him to a public view. I've never heard of anybody abducting somebody and then parading him around. And they, get As he listens to the sheriff, Chris comes to a realization. Whether or not that boy was Jared Adadero, even after a bunch of research, I don't think we're ever going to know. Are you guys go. getting as tired of this story as we are? Well, I wish something <laughs> would resolve it. Park Ranger says he may have seen Jared Adadero just one day after he first became missing. Trouble is, this raises more questions than answers. Although not optimistic about Jared's fate, Chris knows that his story will console a father who's lost his son. It's good that it's out there. I think Mr. Adadero's happy it's out there. For Jared's father, news his son may have been kidnapped is actually a relief. To this day, Jared Adadero has not been found. In the news business, each day brings a new story. We've now hit the highest level of fire preparedness. Chris heads to the suburbs to report on the dangers of a brush fire. I sense fire. Fire! Fire! Back in the newsroom, a bigger story is breaking. So we pulled in a night person here. I mean, I think the story's big. It's suspicious. They got a horseback search going out here. Is it over Shovel's story? Pull him in. Call this ASAP. Norm. Do, do you have a phone that I could call ASAP? Are they changing my story? Watch this. Okay, I, I, we're on our way. Bye. Homeless body, Coors Field. and Chestnut. This is the same exact area that they found like four others over the last couple of months. With breaking news that another body of a homeless man has been found. All hell just broke loose, actually. KCNC Newsroom kicks into high gear. It's Channel 5, go ahead. You just uh, talked to the PIO. Uh, they're saying it is a homeless, another homeless person, a male, but they have no cause of death as of right now. They are still working the scene. Bob Burke's on his way out there. Cameraman Bob Burke is first to arrive. At the scene, there is a massive police presence. Just this morning, about 11.30, we got a call on a body in the field behind us here. In the process of investigating that particular death, we came upon another body north of where the first body was located. Two dead. Uh, yeah, it sounds like there's a second dead one. 17th and Chestnut and 19th and Chestnut. Yeah. Like right on top of each other. This is the original body they found, right? It's two blocks down from the other one. That's got my little fibers. I only have three hairs left, but you know they're kind of standing up on my head, if you know what I'm saying. Deep. We don't know if, it, if it's a murder or if it's an overdose. It's just two dead bodies found. So at this point, we're just treating it as an investigation. As the only available reporter in the field, Chris Schabel races to the scene. Just now they found another one while searching the area. When the stuff is hitting the fan, I love to rock and roll. You get that camera going, and I'll show our audience live exactly what's going on. Norm, is this a fluid situation? Extremely. 
How long do you think it would take you to make uh, Coors Field? Chapel's 45 minutes out, so he can't be there in the five minutes a reporter can. With the news of a second body, KCNC wants a reporter at the scene immediately. Pat Berry is on his way up the street. He'll be down front. I just need a reporter to go with him. Ryan's working the phones on the murder, so... They're not, we can't, they're not murders yet. I'll go if you want, Jackie. Yeah, go. Here. Brian will go. Crime reporter Brian Moss is pulled from the newsroom. Aren't the suspects in some of these murders well, in jail right now? Supposedly. They all were in court yesterday. They're all still in jail. Supposedly. Either copycat or maybe they had the wrong people. How about that? You! First body, I guess, is over there. From his police contact, Brian gets confirmation of what everyone already suspects. AO7 and AO9 are a swap. The homeless bodies just became murders. The mole rats. We will not be stopped. Someone's out there whacking homeless people. Even with news breaking, work on other stories continues. Hi, it's Rick Salinger, reporter at Channel 4. Is Mr. Stoney all there, please? In the newsroom, there are two kinds of stories. Enterprise versus non-enterprise. Non-enterprise, you cover an event. No trial date has been set yet. Enterprise, you dig and you find the information. Then you make the story out of the facts that you get. As an investigative reporter for KCNC... Oh, they're gonna love hearing from me. Rick Salinger, for the past four months, has been putting together a special series on sex offenders in the Denver area. Can you do me a favor if you're going to the Cherry Hills Police Department? Sure. Ask them if they have a sex offender registration list, and if they do, could you pick it up for me? We've been gathering the list of registered sex offenders and then putting a pin where each of these sex offenders lives. Uh, this is the uh, Capitol Hill area of Denver. It's uh, virtually populated with registered sex offenders. Most people don't realize that they're living right there in their own neighborhoods. And so we're going to put these maps uh, on the TV, and I think a lot of people are going to be shocked. Rick's ultimate goal is not to shock the viewers, but to inform them of their rights. A list of registered sex offenders is made available by law, yet most people don't even know that that law exists or that they have a right to that list. If I would have had any idea that my neighbor was a, a sexual predator, I would have paid a lot more attention to my daughter outside in the yard. Earlier this year, these people who had a little girl and didn't know they had a registered sex offender living two doors down, and this man tried to break into the house and molest the girl. So they got a copy of the sex offender registration list and were shocked to learn their neighborhood was just infested. And they then took it on themselves to pass it around all over their neighborhood so their neighbors would know where these people are. Getting the word out is exactly what Rick wants to do. All we're doing is we're telling people what we know about a particular situation. But we have these tools to do it on a mass scale. And that places a heavy responsibility on our shoulders. I have victimized people. That responsibility includes protecting the sex offenders themselves. We're not revealing the exact locations of where they live. It could invite vigilantism. In fact, there was a case in Texas where a person was beaten because that address appeared on the list. It turns out he wasn't the offender. Just say behind Union Station. Nobody knows where 19th and Chestnut is, but say behind Union Station, people know what that is. Brian, just yeah, a little bit this way. Reporter Brian Moss is at the scene where the bodies of two homeless men have been found. Let's go. He stands by, ready to go live. It's on. People, we got a murder scene to go to. You better boogie. Even with Brian already at the scene, Chris is still needed on the story. It's a big story. I mean, someone's continually killing homeless people, and apparently it's not just the people they already have in custody. Jeff, uh, the producer, please talk to me. Hi, Brian Moss. Can you hear me? This is Jeff. Okay, Jeff, I'm ready to go. How soon are you coming to me? But Brian can't break into the 4 o'clock news, already in progress. I was told to get on the air as soon as possible, Jeff. We ran out here and set everything up. We are not taking Brian live until we have Why? Why can't we do this? We want to get him up the bus on because that's what he led with, and we got to get bad on. The managing editor is reluctant to preempt another story. 4 o'clock doesn't seem interested in this, which is a bunch of baloney, so we're the only ones that can go live with this right now. And Nobody else is there. Why can't we do this? 
most nights every station is leading with the same story. So being there first helps you get a leg up on everyone else because they're going to be there sooner or later. Mike, 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 news base on Channel 5. Uh, be prepared, we are going to come to you soon. Back in the newsroom, they've decided to break into the 4 o'clock newscast. Well, we have breaking news to report to you right now. Brian Moss is standing on the scene out at 19th and Chestnut. What, uh, what's going on out there, Brian? Uh, Larry, this is a major breaking story right now behind Union Station in Denver. Two bodies were found in these fields behind me. I've been told, told by Denver police sources each of these appears to be a, a carbon copy of the other. And obviously there is a major and dramatic search going on behind me right now. As more officers arrive to join the search, Brian learns exactly what they're looking for. Hello, Jackie Brian. They're searching for these guys' hands. That's what they're looking for. Both may have been decapitated. Whoa. It's crazy. It's really crazy. The Denver police searched the field where the bodies of two homeless men have been found. Word spreads among the reporters that the murder weapon may have been recovered. KCNC reporter Brian Moss tries to get a confirmation. Hey, Tony. They found a shovel out here. They thought at first it might be the murder weapon. A shovel? But the police are not forthcoming. I don't know. I don't know that either, huh? I don't know anything about a shovel. Quiz, Reporter Chris Schauble finally arrives at the scene. That brings to seven the number of homeless men found murdered in Denver in the past three months. Police are reluctant to draw conclusions. Thanks, Brian Moss. Chris will relieve Brian. I listen to your shot, so I'll just rip off your info. Okay. And report on the continuing investigation. How come you guys aren't calling it a serial killer? What does that mean? Tell me what that means. It means repetitive murders yeah. of similar by person. By M.O. I don't think we're going to take that step. You all want us to take that step, but we're not going to take that step yet. I mean, how many people have to die before they call it serial killings? You know, if it were seven people in the Cherry Creek area, we'd be calling them serial killings. When we speak of sexual predators, is the word interchangeable with sexual offenders? Reporter Rick Salinger has gathered all the sex offender registration lists he needs for his story. In some of these places, you can't get the list of registered sex offenders unless you live in that city. So Carol was kind enough to get me the uh, list for the city where she lives. And I found out there are sex offenders living in the apartment building two doors down from me. And how does that make you? Not very comfortable. 35 to 40 on Street, right there. Part one of Rick's story will air tonight and two station interns have volunteered to help plot out the map he will use. These are all the registered sex offenders in like the Denver metro area. Anything from incest to sexual assault to rape to anything. There's like five and six in some houses. And there's like 16 that live like two doors down from me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at it. It's just it's completely crazy. How many do you think we have? Thousands. There's thousands of them. Oh, 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 I love that shot. I love that shot. <laughs> In preparation for the broadcast, Rick's cameraman has devised a special way to shoot the map. And what Don has done here is hooked up a very neat little camera we call lipstick cam. This is uh, high-tech equipment. We've put the map on top of a trash can. Okay, I'm going to eject you from the room, Rick. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. The shots will show all the registered sex offenders in the greater Denver area, neighborhood by neighborhood. If I had any idea how much work this would be, I would have thought about it twice before suggesting it. This always happens to me. Say, so, ah, great idea. This shouldn't be too hard. And then it just turns out to be massive. It's pretty amazing. You have to wonder if it's a copycat deal, if someone's saying you got the wrong guys. I mean, you have to, I'm sure the cops are wondering all of these theories. And, uh, I mean, the decapitation is just unbelievable. How long do they think the bodies were there? Oh, okay, they know? know they might be out all night. All they said was less than a week. Uh, no, I... But then now they're saying at least one of them could be more than a week. Police are even saying they don't know how the timelines work out. Whether or not the people who are in custody now were already in custody before these guys were dead. 
The grisly nature of the murders has left Chris with a dilemma. They're still searching for evidence, and we know that evidence includes the heads. However, we're intentionally not reporting that, at least right now. They might be bringing hounds at her. The truck just pulled up the dogs in it. Where's the hound dogs? Had to pick up the road. Hey, Chris. And they're going to be here all night looking for these heads. Angie told us not to report it at 5. Has that been discussed again? I, I think it's an, an, an element of the story, so go ahead and go with it. I talked to Angie. That that makes my story much stronger. Yeah, I mean, I'll put it as delicately as possible. So, yeah, they're looking for their heads. Okay. I take my work seriously, but I don't take myself seriously. In the shadows of the Pepsi Tunnel, near Cruz Field, a killer. If we didn't laugh, some of the stuff we cover would make us cry. They're looking for clues. They're not only looking for a murder weapon or weapons, they are also, and shockingly we've learned, looking for the heads of the decapitated victims. When they hear that, they're going to jump out of their seat. It's something about a man putting on makeup that just doesn't seem right. Back at the station, Rick gets ready for the big broadcast. I, well, I look like one of the people in the mug shots that we're going to show if I don't do this. <laughs> Just hope I uh, don't flub this. Anyway, here we go. Thank you. Man, these homeless murders are <laughs> terrible. Rick has last minute jitters about his story. I honestly don't know what kind of a reaction we're going to get. I'm very nervous about it, too. I don't want to set off a, a panic. Colorado lags behind other states in making sex offender registration lists available to the public. He's voice Rick Salinger joins us with a frightening story of why parents need this information. Some 7,000 convicted sex offenders live in Colorado, among them a man with a very chilling story to hear. I sexually assaulted students as a teacher. How many? Uh, in my life, or students, in my life, uh, 70. In Colorado, the law requires sex offenders to register with police. But in almost all cases, the police aren't required to notify you where they live. So where do all those registered sex offenders live? Let's look closer. The area from 6 to Colfax, broadly populated, with those convicted North of sex crimes. On the west side of Denver, you can see the map we put together on our website, which is kcncnews4.com. Thanks, Rick. After months of work, Rick is relieved to have his story finally on the air. I guess the reaction will come in different ways. We'll just have to see what happens. Time to take a look at Colorado weather. 53 right now, DIA, 51 downtown. Northwest winds right now, sustained winds at 22 miles per hour. They're going to bring in 50 detectives at least, canvas the entire area. Terry Jessup is on scene where the bodies of two more homeless men have been found. These guys have been dead for a week. One guy has been dead, they figure, at least a week. Denver police have evacuated the homeless who frequently sleep in this field. I just can't believe no one found them until yesterday. And continue their exhaustive search for evidence. What's the tractor for? Oh, the grass. Tractors have been brought in to clear the overgrown area. What have they found so far? Well, I can't discuss what evidence we have or haven't found uh, or what evidence we're currently looking for. And how do you identify the victims when they were decapitated? Well, at this point, uh, a lot of this depends on what happens at the coroner's office. But he wouldn't confirm whether they recovered the heads, would he? Even a veteran reporter like Terry is struck by the horror of these crimes. We have an angry, angry society out there in the street. I've slept out here myself. Anger has spread to the very people who are being targeted. What's your connection to this? Are you, are you homeless? I'm homeless, I'm Polak. Any theory on who's behind this? We think it's some clowns in the mall. They killed four of my friends. That's bull You know what? Homeless people, we're gonna get together, a bunch of winos. We're gonna go find these little 
You think not? I'm gonna tell you straight out. This is Pollock talking straight up. Denver police finally call off the search of the field where the bodies of the two homeless men were found. These bodies have everyone wondering about possible connections to the five earlier murders. Three men are in custody in connection with the previous homicide. However, they have lawyers and they are not expected to be saying anything further to police. We'll have to wait and see. The three suspects in one of the previous murders are awaiting trial. Uh, I would suspect that somebody is going to talk at some point once they start the plea bargains. If the evidence is strong in the other murder, they may find out more about this one. I think they will solve this. The investigators are not so optimistic, given the victims' transitory lives. It's tough to, to find relatives. It's tough to find even peers because the peer group is so transient. And so that's, I think, what makes it a little difficult to investigate. You know, it must be somebody who was just so teed off that they were blaming on some homeless guys beforehand. And he said, this is I'm a cold-blooded killer. I'll show you. The mounting death toll has left the city in a state of disbelief. The mayor won't say anything earth-shaking, I'm sure, but he will say quite a lot. 10.31 the time. This is Mike Rosen with Mayor Wellington Webb. Two more bodies found. The count is now seven. At a local radio station, Denver's mayor announces that he's appealing for help from the FBI. After these two new bodies were found, as well as the decapitation, I said I think we probably ought to kick it up and get additional assistance to support us. Well, Bill, we do know that that assistance will include processing any forensic evidence that they may have recovered. Although, one officer did tell me they did not recover anything that appeared to be a murder weapon, nor did they recover any parts of bodies. With no immediate leads, a long and difficult investigation lies ahead for the Denver police. Amy, some 7,000 convicted sex offenders live in Colorado. They want me to do what I did at 10 o'clock last night. They liked it so much. <laughs> that uh, they want me to do it again at 4 o'clock. Rick's sex offender story has got the whole town talking. I was on the radio this morning to talk about the series, and then these maps have uh, just gotten a tremendous response. We even got a call from the mayor's office today about it. The reactions from the viewers are pouring in. We're going to read some of these on the air. I watched your special on sex offenders. When you went through the photos, I was sickened when I recognized one of the pictures. It appears as though he may be one of our employees, which is around my children quite often. We don't live in a vacuum. I am deeply disturbed by the way your promo seems to be inciting a witch hunt. We live in a world with all these things going on around us, and to only know about what's happening in your particular life cuts you off these things that could affect you. What right do you have to invade the privacy of those people by you? Every story is different. You can have a good story for different reasons. Have a good evening. See you tomorrow. I think a good story is uh, one that people will say, oh, I'm glad you told me that. That's interesting. We're actually driving through this two square mile crime scene. The field behind Union Station is once again open to the public. I'll be back, Josh. Terry wants to talk to any homeless who may have returned. I'm sure uh, if the weather stays mild, there will be people sleeping back out here at night. There's a hobo camp. This is strange that someone without a home would leave something like this. A Bible. That's nice to see. Nickels, dimes, quarters. Well, you would think someone would be coming back to this, wouldn't you? This will all be skyscrapers someday. Even with Denver's changing landscape, Terry knows that the homeless will always be part of the city. Every person out there has a story. Somebody's uncle. When people say they're homeless, they're transient, they have no roots. It may not be very pleasant, but it is a story. <laughs>